Hello everyone. My name is Chris Murphy. I'm an Unreal Engine evangelist. I handle Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. And today I'm going to be covering building high-end gameplay effects using Blueprint. Now, we're going to have to be stepping through a couple of things to really get this working. Because uh, at the moment, we have this nice, pretty field that we can see, and it looks good. But I'd really, uh, I'd love to destroy it. Uh, just run a big old laser through the entire thing. So we will. So today, we're going to be covering a couple of topics to do that. And the first of those is looking at the landscape system within Unreal. Now, after we go through landscapes, we're going to be looking at blueprints themselves. What are they? How can we use them? Beyond blueprints, we're then going to be looking at render targets. Now, render targets are how we computationally draw something onto uh, a texture. So we're going to use that as a way of leaving a nice wake of destruction uh, behind the laser and wherever we move it. And then, of course, we're going to be integrating that render target into the blueprint so that we can pass some script in and create a more holistic effect. Now, to begin with, I uh, actually want to go arguably a little bit off topic. I actually want to uh, begin by looking at landscapes themselves and give you a quick idea of how these things work. Now, essentially, landscapes allow you to paint different materials and sculpt a, a, a larger terrain in any way that we see fit. So I'm going to get a, a paint, I'm going to select dirt, and I'm going to draw this in. And you'll notice that we're able to actually just draw in sections and have areas that are dirty and areas that are grass. But of course, you can also see that within the grass layer, we have something rather interesting going on, whereby we have this heathering happen. So we have these, uh, these flowers popping up every now and then within it. And that's because that's actually part of the grass material itself. And I'll go into that in just a little bit. And of course, if you're uh, unfamiliar with landscapes, the other thing you might be interested in is that you can just deform the geometry however you see fit. There are various tools to do weird and wonderful things, uh, but I'm not going to be going into them too heavily today. Instead, I'm actually going to open up the landscape material and we're going to dive straight into that. So this, uh, this is the part where I'm going to be a little bit off topic because honestly, whenever someone's setting up a landscape material, they often make um, what I would argue is a, a little bit of a mistake. And that is that if you look at this material, you'll see that I have dirt layers, grass layers, and then I have a blend over here. Now, some of you may be looking at this and saying, well, Chris, why do you have multiple dirt layers? And the thing is, it's actually not different kinds of dirt, which is may maybe what you expect. It's not different kinds of soil, it's nothing like that. Instead, what happens is we have a macro uh, dirt and we have a micro dirt, whereby I get the material for dirt and I make one of them really, really big, which means at a distance, I don't see any tiling because it looks great from afar, okay? But of course, if I was to have that, it would look good from afar, but up close it would look far from good because you would just have these big old textures run under you and it would look hideous, right? So the way around that is I actually use a distance blend to merge between a tiling texture that's up close and under your feet. And if we were to look at this very carefully, I'm going to zoom in so it's a little bit uh, more obvious. I'm just going to move towards this dirt. If you look at it as I zoom in, you'll see there's a threshold about there where I'm actually switching between dirt types. Can you see that? So obviously, because I'm moving so quickly and we're looking out for it, it stands out a little bit. But in situations like this, all tiling is gone. But if I was to look down at my feet, it actually looks quite nice. So this is a technique that I really, really encourage people to look at because when you're setting up landscapes, it's super important. Now, I'm going to uh, apologize ahead of time. Uh, we're going to be making uh, something pretty powerful in this session, but it is going to result in me having to go reasonably quickly because they keep me on a tight leash of 25 minutes. So we're going to be powering through. So if, you, I, if I do lose you, you have my apologies. But but uh, you're more than welcome to catch me after the session and we can discuss various things and I can point you in various directions of what you may have missed. Now, that blend that I mentioned is happening through here and it's done by just looking at a position in the world. I'm going to right click and you can see that the mask changes as I get farther away. When it's black, it's one thing. When it's white, it's the other thing. I'm going to be utilizing that kind of blend in what we do beyond this. So to begin with, we've got our landscape. We can see what's going on here. But it would be really nice if we started to assemble the laser. So I'm going to right click now, and I'm going to create a new blueprint. Now, blueprint is Unreal Engine's scripting language. It's what we use to bind various elements together. So you can write code. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff within blueprint. Or you could set them up as just a nice way of having certain visual assets that are tied into one another. So we're going to be doing that now. We're going to be setting it up such that we have a blueprint that's actually based on an actor. Now, for anyone that's unfamiliar with it, an actor refers to something that has a transform, essentially. And a transform is a location, a rotation, and a scale. So essentially, anything that can be placed in the world is typically going to be inheriting from actor. I'm going to get this and select it. And I'm going to call this BP Shockwave Actor. And we're going to open it up. 
Now you can see that when I pop it open, we have a couple of things uh, on screen. But most importantly, in the center, there's the viewport, which shows you any elements of the, uh, the Blueprint itself that are currently active. And then on the left-hand side, we have the components. So that's actually where we add things uh, to the Blueprint itself. And I'm going to go ahead and add a particle system component. And I'm just going to call this beam effects. And I'm going to set this beam effect to be the beam that I created earlier. Now, I know a lot of people uh, have seen Niagara, which is the new effect system that Unreal Engine has coming in. This effect is not done in Niagara. This is using Cascade. So it is, um, it is still obviously sufficient for what we need to do. Uh, but uh, in future, you will be able to create some pretty powerful effects. So I've added the beam effect. But if I was to look at the base of this, you'll see that we have something that, honestly, I'm not really a fan of. See how the beam just kind of just caps out? I'd really like to add something in the bottom of this to really uh, you know, finalize and add that little bit of polish. So I'm going to add a static mesh component. And when I add a static mesh component, I'm just going to call it beam cap. And I'm going to set it to a 3D mesh that I had from earlier called lava blob. And if you were to look at lava blob, you can see it's, it's only barely appearing underneath there. But I can scale this up to two times its size. And you can now see that we have a nice tessellating mesh that's going to be the, the ooze kind of coming out of this beam. Now, for something like this, I've gone ahead and uh, I'm working with something from earlier. But it's worth noting that while in Cascade, you can set up a 3D mesh as uh, something that's within the effect. I haven't in this case. And the reason for that is that it's a tessellating mesh. And tessellating meshes can't be used within Cascade. So I've added it as an extra component. Now, if I was to hit Compile and go back to here and just drop this into my map, I would have uh, a beam that was doing its job and exploding and disrupting the serenity. So if I look at this, though, and I go up close, we have all of these rocks flying in the air and this big explosion effect happening. But what we don't have is grass that cares in any way about what's going on. So it's time for us to start looking at how we can actually create an effect that's going to let us do that. Now, for us to do that, I'm going to actually be working on the landscape itself and building something kind of creative into it. First off, I'm going to disable the grass, because you can see that these 3D meshes are being placed through the material itself in this landscape output. I'm going to hold down 1 and add a constant, and just turn off the grass so that there's no 3D meshes being placed. I'm then going to go up top, and I'm temporarily going to disconnect the main section of the landscape. And I'm going to work here by dragging off of this and making a material. Now, when I make a material, I'm going to add a texture. So if you think about how this material is going to work, if we want to have a big trail of distract, uh, distraction going behind us, we're going to have to basically project that texture from top down. Is everyone with me on that? We're going to need something that actually shows you where the trail is. And to do that, what we need to do is first off have some sort of way that the texture can be projected such that it aligns with the rest of my environment. So to do that, what I'm going to do is add a texture. And I'm going to set this to be just Arbitrary texture, UE4 logo works. I'm going to get that and just plug it in. And I'm going to hit Apply and let it recreate the landscape. And you'll notice that my landscape is going to be a little less pretty. Uh, but it'll demonstrate the uh, first issue that we have to kind of go and fix, which is that when I apply a texture to a landscape, it's not automatically getting that texture and just plucking it down uh, over the whole thing. Instead, it's tiling over and over and over again. So I need to get this to be the size of my landscape. And to do that, what I'm going to do is look at the current world position of the pixel we're rendering. When I get the world position, what I'm able to do is say, look, I don't care about x and uh, sorry, I don't care about the z axes. I only care about the x and y coordinates because because we're projecting downwards, z doesn't matter. Also, guilty confession, I really enjoy using the word uh, the letter Z whenever I'm referring to an American audience. It's like a nice guilty pleasure for me as an Australian. So I'm going to get this world position, and I'm going to apply a component mask. Now, that gives me the X and Y. And for anyone that is wondering why it says R and G, it's because R, G, B hold the values for X, Y, and Z. Now, within this, I'm then going to get my RNG, and I'm going to divide it by a value so that we can kind of normalize it to the map itself. So I'm going to divide this by 50,400. And for anyone that's going, but Chris, why would you divide something by 50,400? That's a ridiculously big number. The reason is, is that by default, the standard Unreal Engine uh, landscape size, when you've just clicked Create, is 50,400 units across. And that's information that I'm probably going to keep until the day I die. These numbers just stick in my head. So we've got this, and it's, uh, it's starting to render out. I'm going to pull this backwards. 
and we're going to look at the landscape. And you'll see now that the Unreal logo is actually being projected across the entire thing, which is great, because it means that when we get ourselves a destruction texture going into it, we're going to be able to use that texture to now be projected into the world. So to move beyond this, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to right-click in the content browser, and I'm going to create what's known as a render target. Now, a render target, as I mentioned earlier, is a texture that can be modified at runtime. So it's going to be something that we can kind of fool around with and paint the destruction trail onto it. I'm going to set this RT destruction to be the texture that we're using. I'm going to hit Apply so it renders in background. And now it's time for me to move on to the next step. Now, if you think about how we're working here, we have a landscape that's going to allow us to have destruction being painted through it. Okay? And that landscape is going to have to show this effect. Now, this, uh, this effect of the destruction is going to have to have so, uh, the texture itself to hold the information. But more importantly, we need to have some way to save that information to the texture. Now, to do that, we need to create another material that is going to hold the brush, which is essentially going to be given all sorts of information. And then it's going to get rendered down to that render target. So I'm going to create a new material that I'm going to call M underscore RT brush. Now, if anyone is worried about this brush that I'm about to make, and they're looking at this going, Chris, that's a whole lot of math. What are you making me do? It's worth noting that this is available within the content examples of the Learn tab. So you can pull it down for yourself and set it up. Now, if we're setting up something like this, I'm going to need to know a few things. First off, I'm going to know, need to know the position uh, of the force that's being applied in the world. I'm going to get the force position, and we're going to find its position relative to a standard texture coordinate. So if I get my texture coordinates and I look at this, I can see that this gives me the coordinates running from 0 to 1 on the x and y axes, or the red and green, which is why we get 1, 1 down in the bottom right-hand corner, which is what makes up uh, R and G being both the value of 1. Now I'm going to find the distance from that current x and y position to an x and y position that I'm reading in. And again, you have my apologies for this. Uh, if this does kind of jump over, uh, people's heads just a little bit, because I know I am going reasonably quick. So I'm going to get the force position, and I'm only going to, once again, only care about the x and y. And I'm going to find the distance. And you'll notice that when I find the distance between those two, I get a gradient coming from the upper corner. And that's because as I get m further and further away, the value gets bigger and bigger, which means it goes away from black, a value of 0, and approaches 1, a value, uh, uh, sorry, approaches white, which is a value of 1. Now that I've got the distance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this force position by default to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which will just put it in the middle of my brush. Now, for here, I'm going to flip it so that we have white in the middle and uh, black on the outside. It's going to look a little bit strange because it's actually going from black to gray, which means I'm now going from white to gray. So it'll look a little bit strange for just a moment. But I'm going to read in the next variable that's important to me, which is going to be the force uh, size. I'm going to set the force size to be 0 0.5. And I'm going to subtract the inverse of that from my current brush. Once again, this material is in the content examples. And you can pull this straight out. So we've now got something that looks a bit more appropriate for a brush. And that means that I'm going to do the last little thing that I need to do, which is saturate it, which clamps it to a value between 0 and 1. And after I've saturated it, I'm going to multiply it against the scalar that says this is how strong I want it to be, which I'm going to call force strength. And I'm going to set that to a value of 0 0.5. It's plugged in. I'm going to go to emit. Now, this may seem that the brush is now done. I've got myself a nice radial fall off. But there is one last thing I need to do, which is if you think about how a trail of destruction moving through the world would work, it needs to keep the previous render target in, in, like, in place. Because we're keeping, like, we're smearing that white value of the, the, the destruction through the texture itself. And at the moment, this would actually be painting black and white into the texture. So what I need to do is tell this to be an additive blend by going down to my blend mode. And that will now add this to the previous render target, resulting in it uh, allowing me to create a trail. So I've got those set up. I'm going to hit Apply and Save. And it's time for me to go back into my blueprint and do something a bit more interesting. Every time this pops up, I forget just how bright it's going to be on my screen. So we've got this in place. I'm going to go to my construction script, and I'm going to start modifying what I've created. So in my construction script, for anyone that's unaware, a construction script holds the script of when an object is first constructed. So when you add it to the world, it's going to execute this. And in this situation, what I wanted to do is create something in memory that's going to hold a reference to my, uh, my brush. So I'm going to say, create a dynamic material instance and make it equal to the brush. 
Now, you may have done something like this before if you're a UE4 user. Typically, people do something like this when they're working with like setting the color of an object or doing something like that. But you don't actually need to do it to a 3D object in the world. Interestingly enough, you can just have the material existing in memory, and then we can play with it there. So I'm going to create a dy dynamic material instance, and I'm going to promote this to a variable as something that we can store. And I'm just going to call it uh, brush mid, mid standing for material instance dynamic. So I'm going to go to my event graph, which handles the code that executes while the game's playing. And I'm going to create a new custom event called draw at location. And within draw at location, what I'm going to be doing is just setting those parameters that I previously had inside of my material over here. So the first thing I need to do is set this force position. So I'm going to go uh, get my brush bid, and I'm going to say set vector, and just set a vector parameter. The vector parameter I'm setting is called force location. And I'm going to set that to be a value that's normalized between 0 and 1. So it's going to tell me where we are relative to that big square that we're projecting onto the environment. Now, to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my current location. And I'm just going to divide my current location by the size of the map, which we established before. Mm, float. Which we established before is 50,400. I'm going to right click. Promote to variable, and I'm going to call this map size. And just plug that in. And it's now time for me to quickly do this to the other variables. So I'm going to get my brush mid once again, and I'm going to set the scalar parameter for force size. Now, the size of the brush, I typically would want to be a value of 1024. It's just 10 meters. However, I'm going to have to divide that. I'm going to have to divide that by the map size. So again, it's a value between 0 and 1. Oop, wrong one. Great. Plugged in. And then finally, the last thing that I need to do is set the force strength. So I'm going to connect that again and say force strength. Now, what I'm going to be doing here is setting the strength to be equal to the time since the last time I rendered it multiplied by a number. To do that, I need to get the delta time, which is the time since the last tick. And I'm just going to multiply this by a number that's going to control how powerful it is, which 20 seems like a good fit. Now that I've done that, I need to render this to the texture. And to do that, I'm just going to get the brush. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to say render to texture. Oops. Um, render material, sorry. There we go. Draw material to render target. I got it in the end. I'm going to get that, and it's going to say which texture, the one that we created. Which material? Well, we want to set it to the brush mid. So it's rendering this to that. And if I were to hit compile and save, I would need to do one last little thing. On tick, I'm going to call draw at location. Compile, save. So if I was to go back to my shockwave actor and just zoom in, I'm going to hit play. Oops, that was a good trick. Force location, force size, force strength, location. Sorry about this, everybody. I've clearly made one tiny mistake in my material. Force position had to happen eventually. I see what I've done. I called it force position, and I called it force location. <laughs> Good trick. I'm like, this should be working. Fantastic. OK. So now that I've said that, you can see that as I drag this through the world, we've got something that it works OK. It's going to start to be the, the, uh, the important part of our effect. Two things I want to change. First off, I want to open up my render target. And I'm just going to increase the quality of this from 256 to 512. Be aware that when you do this, you're getting something that is going to be, when I double the resolution, it's four times the overhead, because it's double x and double y. So one, two, three, four. So I've set that. I'm going to hit Save. And now it's time for me to go and uh, I'm going to start building this effect. So there we go. We can see that's a much nicer, smoother circle that we're painting. I'm going to start building this effect back into my landscape itself. So I'm going to hit Stop. And I'm going to open my landscape. So let's go back into the simple landscape. And it's time to, uh, to kind of clean this up a bit. So first off, I need to tell this. I need to have, I've got a mask that's between 0 and 1, right? And wherever it's 0, we want to have it equal to my previous landscape. And what I'm going to do is set it so that whenever it's 0.5, that's when it's going to be charred ground. And whenever it's 0.5 to a value of 1, that's when I kind of want to have some lava and general destruction coming up. So I've gone ahead and already made a material function ahead of time called 
charred ground, which I'm going to be using for this. So to do this, uh, if I just quickly preview this charred ground effect. So I'm just moving these down. If I preview this charred ground effect, I'm just going to copy these UVs over to it. Um, if I was to preview this effect, it would look like this. So I'm just going to preview it. And you can see that it's charred and looking kind of gooey. And then when a, at the moment, I've set it to a sine wave for testing that's going to raise the lava height and drop it again. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell it to blend, as I said, between the existing material and the charred ground material. And as I mentioned, I need it to be whenever it's a value between 0 and 0 0.5, which means I'm going to look up the existing texture. And if I multiply it by 2, what that means is every value that was previously 0 0.5 is now going to be a value of 1, right? So 0 to 0 0.5 is now going to be a value of 0 to 1. I'm going to tell it to, uh, I'm going to clamp it using a saturate node, which is basically saying ignore everything after 1 and everything below 0. And I'm going to connect that to my alpha. And then for my lava height, whenever it's 0 0.5 to 1, I'm going to do a very similar piece of functionality, whereby I get this value, I subtract 0 0.5, thus making it between negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. I'm going to multiply that by 2, thus making it a value between negative 1 and 1. Saturate it, which makes it a value between 0 and 1, and disregard, uh, just yeah, throws away all of the extra values. And then I'm going to connect that into here. And I know I'm moving quickly, but feel free to talk to me after the session. So now that I've plugged that back in, it's worth noting I've kept the actual material uh, off in the sense that the, sorry, the grass material off. So it's going to be rendering the standard landscape, but it's not going to be putting my 3D meshes in just yet. And that's because I want you to generally see how this effect works. It's times like this. There we go. So you can see here that if I was to hit play, we've got the start of something interesting. And of course, they're going to nicely link up because that black to white mask is now giving us something that's just a little bit cooler. Now, for us to finish this effect off, what I'd really like to do is add the grass back in, but I actually need to tell it to hide the grass in certain locations. So to do that, what I'm going to uh, have to do is look at this uh, render texture that we've got. And remember that the render texture is just existing in memory. And the great part of that is it means that any existing material can also reference that render target. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reconnect the grass over here. And then I'm going to just copy and paste this. And I'm just going to open up the, uh, the materials for the grass and the flowers. So I'm going to get the grass, open it up. And I'm going to be a little bit cheeky, and I'm just going to ignore everything that we have here and essentially just get this multiply. Now, at the moment, this multiply goes between uh, it's, it's, wi it's white wherever it's being lasered, and it's black wherever it's not being lasered. But if you think about it, if we were to flip that around so that it was, it was black wherever we have lasered and white wherever we haven't lasered, and yes, lasered is not really a word, um, I'm going to be going ahead, flipping it around, and then just multiplying that against the existing opacity mask. So I'm going to get this. I'm going to flip it. And to flip it, I do what's known as a 1 minus, a, which we saw earlier. And I'm going to multiply that against the existing opacity mask. And then just plug that in. Fantastic. I'm going to hit Apply. I'm going to grab all of this, Control-C. And I'm going to open up the, uh, the Heather. And within the Heather, I'm going to paste this in and do the exact same thing. And I know this is quite ugly, but it's because I've only got 25 to get through a giant laser. Give it Apply. And I'm just going to give this a second while it builds the shaders. Fantastic. So you can see here that the grass is being affected by it. And the there we go. The Heather's kicked in as well now. So as I hit Play, I'm able to now move this beam and all of the 3D meshes that were in that way. And then, you know, if I wanted to go the, the whole way through this, I could get that and make it blacken the, uh, the grass as it gets closer before I made it disappear. And I could do all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff like that. But at the moment, this is working reasonably well. You know, we've got a, a pretty tight effect. It's, it's, working, pretty, it's working quite nicely. Um, 
The only uh, thing that I would like to do from here, though, is I'm going to hit stop. And I'm, can anyone notice the, the problem with what's going on right now? When I hit play, my laser is not unlasering. It's staying as it was, OK? So I actually need to clean this up. And to do that, I'm going to go into my shockwave actor. I'm going to go into my shockwave actor. I'm going to create a new event. And I'm going to call this uh, clear render target. And when I call clear render target, all I'm going to be saying is call this little thing called clear render target 2D. I'm going to set it to just erase my current render target. Now, the reason I'm doing it here is that I could say, hey, on begin play, I want you to do clear render target. But the reason I've made this a separate event is that if I click here, I can hit this button called Call in Editor, which now makes this event something that if I were to go into the world and select my uh, shockwave, I now actually get a button that whenever I click is just going to automatically run that. So when I click it, all of my destruction is gone. And if I hit Play, it's going to just begin painting that destruction right back in there. So that's all we're going to be kind of uh, that's all we're going to be covering today in this session. We have another session coming straight up afterwards. Um, if you have any questions, I've unfortunately run out of time. I've got to pass this over to Short, I think, here, uh, who's going to be running through volumetric fog. Now, uh, if you want to ask me any questions, I'll be lingering here for just a little bit, and then for the rest of the day, I'll be over in this community booth over here. So you're more than welcome to uh, just ask me anything you want, and uh, hopefully I can give you a better understanding of how Blueprint works. Uh, otherwise, enjoy the rest of GDC, and I hope this talk was informative. Thank you very much.